But they couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd. So through the crowd, someone said, hey, you know your mom's here? Hey, you know your brothers are here? And Jesus wasn't diminishing the value of the family, but he was elevating the value of the Word of God, of hearing it, sharing it, and obeying it. More important than your biological family. Jesus said, if you follow me, take up your cross and follow me. If you hate not your father and mother and your own life inside, you're not fit to be my disciple. More important than your own biological family is your hearing God's word, receiving God's word, sharing God's word, and obeying God. You know, hearing is really important, and how we hear is very important. I heard of a couple that was celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, and the husband got up to speak to his wife, and he said, after 50 years of marriage, I have found you tried and true. And she said, what did you say? After 50 years of marriage, he raised his voice. I found you tried and true. She said, well, listen here, Buster. After 50 years of marriage, I'm tired of you, too. <laughs> Not the response he was hoping for. Take heed how you hear. I want you to peek at this, verse 8 of chapter 8. Jesus cried, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Then look at verse 18. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. And look at verse 21. Hear the word of God and do it. About seven times in our text, we find the word hear, and it has more than just the idea of literally hearing. Each time the word hear appears in the text, it actually carries the idea of hearing receptively and responding obediently. So it's not just in one ear and out the other. You ever heard the expression, in one ear, out the other? It's because there's usually not a lot between the ears to keep it there. Or we're not really listening. So we need to hear the Word of God. We need to receive the Word of God. We need to share the Word of God. And we need to obey the Word of God. So the word hear actually carries the idea of hearing receptively and hearing obediently. So we're going to be looking at the story of the parable of the sower and the seed. And it's really not the story of the sower. It's not the story about the seed. It's a story about the soil, the heart of man. And it's going to be in the context of Jesus preaching the gospel and people's receptivity and response to the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus was preaching. Take heed how you hear. Romans 10, verse 17 says, faith comes by what? And hearing by the word of God, or literally by a sermon preached about Christ. So we need the most important hearing that we can have is hearing God's word. Now, one of the reasons why we open the Bible and literally read the text and then expound the text is because God speaks through what he's spoken. The Bible is the living, powerful, active word of God. It's like an unto seed. It has life in it. It has power in it. it brings forth fruit. So we want to hear the word. You're going to hear the word this morning, and you want to receive the word, and you want to share the word, and then you want to be obedient to God's word. Now, there's three responses to the word. First is hearing and receiving the word, verses 1 to 15, large section, and we're going to break it into little pieces. Look at with me at verse 1. It says, it came to pass afterward. Now, afterward is referring to his ministry in chapter 7 in the area of Galilee. All of this takes place in the area of the Galilean ministry. He'd just been in the home of Simon, the Pharisee, and just had spoken forgiveness to the woman who washed his feet with her tears, wiped them with the hairs of his head, and put the perfume on them. That Jesus went about every city and village preaching and showing glad tidings, 
This is the good news of the kingdom of God, and the 12 were with him. That's the 12 chosen apostles. And certain women, verse 2, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. Now, these first three verses many times are read, and you go right into the parable of the sower and the seed, and you kind of miss these first three verses, how the stage is set for why he spoke the parable. Take you back to verse 1 for just a moment. Jesus in his Galilean ministry, all the villages and towns he went to, was preaching. The word preaching is the Greek word keruso. Same word used in 2 Timothy 4 where Paul told Timothy, preach the what? The word. The word preach there means proclaim. It was used of a herald who would announce for a king with his authority. So proclaim the word. So Jesus was a preacher. Someone said God had only one son and he was a preacher. I love that. So Jesus traveled around, he was preaching, and we're going to see that he also gave parables to draw people into the things of the kingdom of God. So he's preaching. So in verse 4 to the end of verse 21 is all about the receptivity to his preaching. You ever wonder why with all the gospel preaching going on in the world today, more people don't believe in Jesus? You ever wonder why with all the television, internet, radio, all the broadcasting of God's word, why isn't the world all come to Christ and believe in the gospel? Where we're going to read in the parable the four different responses that men have to this preaching, verse 1, that Jesus was giving in the crowds and the thongs there in Judea. So he's somewhere around the Sea of Galilee, Lake Gennesaret there in Galilee. Now, it mentions the women in verse 2 and 3, and Luke's gospel actually features women more than any other gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. There's more about women in Luke's gospel. It's been called the gospel of women. So, these women traveled with Jesus and his disciples, and verse 3, ministered unto him of their substance. Now, that means that they probably fed them, they probably took care of their needs, uh, of their clothing and wear. Maybe they, 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 they housed them, but they supported the ministry materially and helped them do the ministry of the Lord. I probably don't need to mention it, but I'm a bachelor this weekend. My wife went to see our grandkids in Idaho. And after 46 years of marriage, Five days without my wife, pray for me. (laughs) I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm supposed to do or should do. I don't know what I've eaten the other for the last several days. I think it was Friday night. I had chips for dinner. (laughs) She's got all this food. All I have to do is warm it up, and the bag of chips is so much quicker and easier. (laughs) And I can eat the whole bag and watch whatever I want on TV, but it's a miracle that I'm here this morning. (laughs) So Jesus and his disciples had these women say, hey, it's time to eat. No, you can't eat that. You need to eat this, and you need to take a rest, and you need to go to bed, and you need to, you know, just just to support him and to take care of him. But what what a blessing that was. Now, again, the context, preaching the gospel of glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Now, verse 4 down to verse 8, he gives us the parable of the sower and the seed. This is a parable that primarily is conveying the lesson on why more people don't receive the gospel. Let's read it. It says, when much people, now again, verse 1, he went through every city and village preaching. So there's a lot of people, verse 4, who were gathered together and were come out, of, out to him of every city, and he spake by parables. Now, notice the people, huge crowds. The place is Galilee and the parable. Now, 
This was given other Gospels. And by the way, this story is recorded in Matthew 13. Write that down. Matthew 13 and Mark chapter 4. That means all three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all record the parable of the sower and the seed. And actually, this, as much as I love the Gospel of Luke, if I'm going to preach this parable, I would preach it from Matthew or Mark. They're more complete. There's a lot more information in those other synoptic Gospels. And one of the things is the setting at the Lake Galilee. It actually says that the crowds were pressing Jesus, so he had to step into a boat, probably Peter's boat or James and John's boat, and then to go out on the Lake Galilee a little distance, he sat down on the boat and he preached back to the crowd sitting on the seashore. And if you've ever been to Sea of Galilee, it's a beautiful setting. And like many lakes, the ground slopes down to the lake. And as he pushed out into the lake a little bit, sat on the boat, it would form just a natural amphitheater. And the water would serve acoustic purposes to carry his voice over the water, <coughs> excuse me, to the crowds as Jesus taught in the boat. And in those days, the teacher sat and the people stood. I think that that's a good idea. We maybe should reverse that today. I stand and preach and you get to sit. You know, if you think the sermons are long, try standing and preaching them. And when will this guy get ever be over? You're sitting down, so cool your jets. Not only you're sitting, but a lot of people sleep while I preach. Someday I'm going to say something like, hey, that guy, that third guy in that row right there, someone go wake him up. Busted. So Jesus is sitting in the boat, probably some disciples at waist deep water holding onto the boat, and he's preaching to the multitudes. What a beautiful picture. And then he begins to speak this parable. Now, the word parable that we see there in verse 4 is the Greek word parabole. It's taken from two words, para. Bole, you know what it means? To place alongside, to put beside. So what a parable is, is an earthly story alongside spiritual truth. So it's an extended analogy. They're always taken from reality. So he tells a story. And that was a story common to them. <clears throat> Many feel like as Jesus was bobbing in the boat and preaching from the boat, that maybe he said, behold, and maybe there in the field, there was someone sowing or broadcasting the seed, and he used this as an analogy to get the people's attention. So notice the parable begins in verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed. So we have a sower sowing seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Then some fell on rock, as the sower sowed his seed. And soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And then verse 7, some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. So you have the hard soil, you have the rocky soil, you have the thorny soil. And then verse 8, and other fell on good ground, sprang up and bare fruit, a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, again, we're going to look at the meaning of the parable, but note the picture of the parable. Now, when they would sow seed, they didn't have a little, how do you like my sound effects? You know, this little thing they'd fill out and they'd, I don't know what you call those things. Put the seed in, spin thing, and it throws the seed out, right? You guys got that? Spreader, get it Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever, the little spreader. Or maybe a spreader that they would roll. They would actually throw the seed. So they would get a basket or they would put a, a piece of cloth around their neck. They would have a bag in front of them, fill it with seed, and they would walk in the fields and they would throw the seed. You know what it was called? Broadcasting. That's where we get our word broadcasting from. Just throw it out, broadcasting the seed. So you never knew where the seed would exactly land. I know many times I've tried to reseed my yard, never works. And some of the seed may land on the sidewalk. You don't expect that to grow, right? You don't water the seed on the sidewalk expecting it to grow grass. It's got to land in good soil. So there's different ways the seed responds by where it lies. So the first seed 
fell on the beaten path. What was that? Verse 5. In their fields, they didn't have roads that were asphalt, curbs, concrete. They had dirt paths. And they would cut these paths to all their fields where their farms were. And the more they walked on the dirt and path, they were only about three feet wide, the ground would become hard as concrete. You've seen ground that's hard like that. So when the seed landed there, the birds see the seed, and they would swoop down and pick it up. Now, just a little note, too. They would sow the field with the seed. Then they would plow it to, to cover it. So they would first sow the seed, then they'd plow it and cover the seed, push it into the ground. But this seed fell on the beaten path. Birds got the seed, flew off. Seed brought forth no fruit. Then the second category, some fell on rock. Now, again, this is where Luke is not my preference over Matthew and Mark. This is actually a thin layer of dirt on top of rock. So it doesn't mean rocky, which it was rocky, but it means shallow. It means a thin layer of dirt with limestone bedrock underneath it, meaning that the fruit, the seed could not get depth of root and moisture. And when the sun beat upon it, which the other gospels tell us, it withered and it died. So seed number one, no fruit. Seed number two, no fruit. Seed number three, verse seven, fell among thorns. So we have the hard soil, verse five, the thin layer of rocky soil underneath the dirt, verse six, and then the thorny soil, verse seven. So the seed takes root into the ground, but it doesn't bear fruit. Again, no fruit, number one, no fruit, number two, no fruit, number three because the weeds choke out the seed. Again, anytime I've tried to reseed a yard or plant grass, all I get is weeds and thorns, and it chokes out the good grass. Then there's the good ground, verse 8. Other fell on the good ground, sprang up, bare fruit, hundredfold. Now, in the other Gospels, it says hundredfold, thirtyfold, sixtyfold. So there's different degrees of fruitfulness, but all are fruitful in this fourth category, the good ground. And when he had thus said these things, he cried and said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So check and make sure you have ears and that your ears are open and listening to what Jesus has to say. Then in verse 9 and 10, he actually, before he explains the parable, gives us the purpose of his parabolic teaching. And again, if you get a chance, please write this down, you Bible students. Matthew 13 is a lot more extensive and in-depth and full in this quotation from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, that is quoted here in our text as to why Jesus spoke in parables. His disciples ask him, saying, verse 9, what might this parable be? So if you just, listen to me, if you just read the parable and stopped right there, what does it mean, right? You got the hard soil, you got the shallow soil, you got the thorny soil, you got the good soil. What does it mean? And a lot of preachers have a field day making the parable say what they want it to say. That's not the way the Bible should be handled. They can read into the parable an unintended meaning or purpose for the parable. Jesus, most of the time, explained the parable's meaning. So we should look to Jesus for the explanation of the meaning of the parable. And parables were intended to mean one main lesson. So don't make the parable walk on all four. Don't read into the text. That's what's called eisegesis putting in, pull out of the text itself, exegesis, the meaning of the parable. So very important. So what does it mean, verse 9? He said unto them, unto you. Now that's a reference to his disciples. It is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. That's where we want to be. We want to be on the in group. We want to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. We want to be believers. We want to be receivers. We want to be receptive to the Word of God. We want revelation from God 
So that's the category we want to be. So the parables were to reveal to his disciples or believers, including us, mysteries that were hidden but now are revealed. But it also conceals to those whose hearts are hardened by sin and have rejected the gospel in Christ, but to others in parables that seeing they may not see. So they hear the parable, but they don't understand. Hearing might not understand. Now, don't misinterpret these words. Jesus was not trying to hide truth from unbelievers. But the parable sifted out believers to unbelievers. Believers looked into it. They were open to it. They believed. They received. They got revelation. They got more knowledge. Unbelievers just dismissed the teaching, wanted nothing to do with the teaching. By the way, this is a turning point in Christ's teaching. He begins now to speak in parables most often because it weeded out the true believers from the false believers. So the parables didn't blind them. The parables revealed their blindness and hardness of heart. And by the way, the end of verse 10 in our text is a quotation from Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10, where Isaiah preached and the people's hearts were hardened and they would not listen. Now, verse 11 to 15, we get the meaning of the parable. The parable is this, verse 11. The seed is the what? So, question, what is the seed? Duh. Pretty easy, right? So, let the Bible interpret the Bible. The seed is the Word of God. You know, the Bible is wonderful because it's living. You ever thought about seeds? Seeds freak me out. No batteries. Don't recharge them. You don't plug them in. You can put one in a drawer. It can sit there for years. You take it out of the drawer, put it in the soil, water it, right conditions, what happens? It produces life. I mean, you just look at a seed like, where does that life come from? That is the freakiest little thing. The Bible is like seed. When it comes into our hearts, it's living, active, and powerful. The Bible says that it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's seed, it's a sword. It's like a hammer, it's like a mirror. The Bible is like a seed, it's wonderful, it's powerful. It's got the power to transform our lives. Heard of a guy that had a Bible fall apart, so he took just his New Testament. And as I have done sometimes in my Bible, he had it rebound with leather, he had it, had, it, had it rebound. And the binding was so thin that he couldn't write the New Testament on there, so he just had TNT put on there. I thought, that is cool, TNT, the dynamic power of God's Word, amen? Because it's like seed. It's also fruitful. Cool thing about seed, and there's one little seed, you can put it in the ground, it can create a corn stock of corn with multiple ears of corn with multiple seeds for multiple more corn. It has the capacity to bear much fruit. So it's alive and powerful. It transforms our lives and it produces great fruit. Now, there's also a sower. So there's a seed and there's a sower. Matthew 13, verse 37 says, the sower is the son of man, but it's also referring to anyone, listen carefully, all of us who share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you are sharing the word, whether it be formally in a church or on a radio or on a platform or just in your home or with anyone, you're spreading the seed the powerful Word of God. So the sower is the preacher. By the way, there's so many lessons here that I can't bring out, but this parable is encouragement to preachers of the gospel and all of us as believers to faithfully broadcast, scatter, and sow the seed 
because it's wonderful, powerful, and fruitful. Amen? Even if people don't all respond the way we want, we must sow the seed. We must liberally sow the seed. And I'm so glad to be a part of a church that's doing just that. We are spreading the seed of God's Word. We're getting God's Word out radio and on the internet, and God is using it to bless and minister to so many. But the parable is not about the seed. The parable is not about the sower. The focus is about the soil. The four soils represent, listen carefully, the hearts of those who hear the word, how they hear the word of God. So the parable is about the soils. It's not about the sower. It's about the seed. Now, the different responses had nothing to do with the seed. The different responses had nothing to do with the seed. The seed was the same. So we don't compromise the seed. We so proclaim, categorize the word of God faithfully and let God produce the fruit he wants. The parable was not teaching that the different responses had anything to do with the sower. The sower wasn't responsible. So the seed was the same, the sower was the same. This is, for me as a preacher, encouraging. All I need to do is faithfully share the word of God, and God will bring forth the fruit that he's ordained. Amen? Amen. So we need to keep that in mind. But the parable is about the soil and the different responses to the seed, the Word of God. So the differences lie in the kinds of soil. Let's look at them for just a moment. First soil is what I've called the unresponsive soil or the hard heart, verse 12. So by the wayside, those seeds are they which hear, then comes the devil. Notice, by the way, there is a devil or Satan, which taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now, notice this seed is called the hard soil. So this is the hard beaten path. The seed falls on the path, and the birds steal the seed, and it brings forth no fruit during, a, during that time. Now, notice that this seed falls on hard soil, and the devil is pictured by the birds, remember, who swooped down, stole the seed, and took it away, lest they should believe and be saved. Got that? So this is what's called the hard heart. Satan does what he can to oppose the gospel, harden people's hearts. Why does he harden hearts? Well, because he doesn't want them to receive the Word of God. So the hardships of life, the proud, sinful heart of man, Satan comes, and 1st, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 said, the God of this world has blinded their minds lest they should see the truth and be saved. So Satan hardens hearts. Now, even though the devil is re represented by the birds and steals the seed, the soil or the person is responsible. They can't pass the blame to the devil made me do it or the devil hardened my heart. Satan uses our hard hearts against the word, but it's us who are responsible for hardening our hearts and believing the gospel. In Psalm 10 verse four, it says, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek God. God is not in all of his thoughts. So because of sin, and hardships of life, people harden their hearts. Sometimes you share the glorious, marvelous, wonderful truth of the gospel, and people are like hard-hearted rocks. Satan blinds their minds. They don't receive the word. It doesn't change their lives. It doesn't produce any fruit. Now, there's a second heart represented in verse 13. That's the heart I call the unresponsive heart, or the impulsive heart, or the shallow heart. The hard heart, then the shallow, superficial, impulsive heart. 
They that are on the rock, remember this is a thin layer of soil, they hear and they receive the word with joy. So there's an immediate but superficial response. It's shallow. These have no root, notice that, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. Now, I don't want to open a can of worms, but I'll do it anyway. I happen to believe, and I, I could be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. If I thought I was wrong, I wouldn't believe it. That the first, second, and third soils represent people who were not born again. Professing, maybe, maybe emotional response, but they didn't really get regenerated or born again. They weren't saved. Only one out of the four, the fruitful heart, brings forth fruit. So my, my, my f- belief is that these first three should be categorized as people who are not truly saved. Can someone that's saved stumble and fall, backslide for a time? Yes, I don't believe they lose their salvation, but they lose their sanctification and many times service for Christ and rewards. But this is not what it's talking about here. It's talking about people who do not respond with receptivity properly to the word and bring forth no fruit, no evidence of true conversion. So this is an emotional response. In Mark chapter 4, verse 16, it says, they have heard the word immediately, they receive it with gladness. So these are the emotional hearers. Now, many times the gospel that was preached to them was not preached that they are sinners, that they need to repent, that they need to trust Jesus as their Savior, but it's a gospel of you want to be happy, come to Jesus. Sometimes even you want to be rich, come to Jesus. You want Jesus to give you joy, come to Jesus. You want Jesus to heal your marriage, come to Jesus. It's a feel-good, I'll try Jesus out. You know, Jesus is not a pair of shoes that you try out. And when you buy a pair of shoes, you try them out, right? You kind of walk around. He, 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 he. Yeah, I think they're good. Then you get home and you wear them all day. You go, no, they're not good. You don't try Jesus out. You must come to him contrite as a child. You must see that he is the Savior. You are a sinner, that he's your only hope. You bring nothing in your hand, and you trust him to save you. If there isn't true repentance and faith in Christ, and there isn't true regeneration, and you aren't born again, then you're not really a Christian at all. But you can have an emotional experience. Even when I give an invitation on Sunday morning, I understand that maybe some in the crowd just came forward because their friends came forward. Or they came forward because of the emotion of the moment, or the time they're sad, they want want help. But... God knows my job is just to sow the seed, amen? His job is to convict and to convert, to regenerate and dwell. But we can't see a person's heart. We can only see their fruit. Sometimes it looks like, oh, they, they're, they're so emotional, they're crying. Well, th- that, that, that may not be tears that are sincere or genuine. Or they're so excited, they get all excited. They started coming to church, they started reading their Bibles. But There wasn't true salvation that took place. Their commitment was shallow, superficial, emotional in its response. Then notice at a time of temptation, verse 13, they fall away. Now that word temptation would be better understood as trial or testing. Could be temptation, but in the context, the same word means two different things, different contexts. It's probably referring to test or trial. You ever known somebody that had what seemed to be a true conversion, a lot of emotion, a lot of excitement. They get really excited about Jesus, but the minute something goes wrong, they're check out. The minute their marriage isn't fixed, they check out. People come to us for marriage counseling, and they've been married for 20 years, and they want us to fix it in one hour. They bring us teenagers that are all messed up and they want us to fix them in an hour. 
You messed them up for 18 years and you want us to fix them in one hour? It's not going to happen. True repentance, true faith in Christ, being born again, we become new creatures, old things pass away, all things become, that'll fix it. But only God can do that in a person's heart. So this is an impulsive, shallow response. And when trials come, by the way, trials, verse 13, are meant to strengthen our faith and to help produce more fruit in our lives. So you know when a Christian is tried and tested, guess what happens? Their faith is strengthened and they bear more fruit. When a professing Christian is tried and tested, he falls away and doesn't bear fruit. Same sun that melts wax hardens clay. So the condition of the heart is what matters. Now there's a third soil in verse 14. This is the crowded heart. So we have the hard heart, verse 12, the shallow, emotional, superficial heart, verse 13. Now we have the crowded heart, verse 14. That which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked. And then notice he breaks it down. Cares, riches, and pleasures of this life choke the seed and it bears no fruit. Now again, Matthew and Mark have a far more colorful and in-depth description of the seeds that choke out the fruit of the seed and that brings forth no fruit. Now notice this is the preoccupied or crowded heart. Many times people have a shallow, superficial commitment. They're not born again. And then the seed of worry, the worry, not seed, but the weeds of worry. You know, many times people <clears throat> bring forth no fruit because all they do is worry all the time. They don't trust God. True Christians can do this too, right? They're worried about their finances. They're worried about their health. They're worried about their marriage. They're worried about their kids. They're worried about their problems. I heard of a guy that woke up one night worried about his owed some neighbor money, and he was pacing around in the bedroom, and his wife woke up and said, what's your problem? Why aren't you sleeping? He goes, I, I haven't told you this, but I borrowed $1,000 from our neighbor Joe and I don't have the money to pay him back. I was supposed to pay him back yesterday and I don't have the money, so I can't sleep, I'm worried. So his wife gets out of bed, she opens the window and screams to the neighbor, Joe, Joe, Joe! He wakes up, opens the window. He says, what? He said, you know that thousand dollars my husband owes you? He hasn't got it. She slammed the window shut, turned to her husband and said, now let him get up and worry about it and you go to bed. <laughs> Love it. You know, we worry, we're, I call these worry weeds, and it chokes out God's word. I, can't, I, I, just, I just can't read the Bible right now, I'm too worried. Then notice the riches, verse 14. Deceitfulness of riches. So there's the worry weeds, and then there's the riches. In Matthew chapter 13, it's called the deceitfulness of riches. I call these money weeds. Jesus said, you can't serve God and money. And then there's the pleasure weeds, verse 14. Pleasures of this life. The other gospels have lust for other things. You know one of the signs that we're in the last days is men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God that they will have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Remember when the rich young ruler wanted to follow Jesus and he said, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me and you have treasures in heaven. But he turned and went sorrowfully away because he didn't want to give up his riches. So that riches choked out the word and it brings no fruit forth to eternal life. Then the fourth, here's the good soil. Responsive, fruitful heart, verse 15. But, here's the contrast, that on the good ground, so this is a good heart, are they which in an honest, good heart, having heard the word, keep it 
and bring forth fruit with patience. In Matthew 13, verse 23, it says they produce fruit a hundred, sixty, and thirty fold. So the evidence of salvation is not your emotions or your enthusiasm, it's fruit. Sixty, thirty, and a hundred fold. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. Now the question is, how much fruit? How quickly the fruit's born? So we need to be patient, it says patience. We need to be careful not to judge people, but there must be some fruit in your life to indicate that your heart has been receptive. So unlike the hard heart, the heart is softened by the Holy Spirit. If your heart is hard, ask God to soften it. Unlike the shallow soil, the heart is deep. This is a deep, sincere commitment, not superficial or just emotional. And then the cluttered heart, this is a heart that's clean. It's not bound by money or pleasures or the deceitfulness of this life. It's a good heart, verse 15, prepped by the Spirit, repentant, turns in faith, believes in Jesus Christ, and trust Him for salvation. Now, believing alone is necessary for salvation. But believing also revol involves, it's part of believing, is repentance, turning, and receiving the Word of God and being born of the Spirit. That's true, genuine salvation. We want to be in that fourth category. Now, we're going to look at them quickly. Verse 16 to verse 18, hear and share the Word. Hear the Word and receive it, not hear the Word and share it. He says, no man when he hath light a candle, that should be a lamp, covers it with a vessel or a basket, but puts it on, or puts it under a bed. If you light a lamp, you don't put it under a bushel or a basket. You don't put it under a bed, but you put it on a candlestick or a lampstand. You set it on a lampstand that they which enter, that is the house, may see the light. So again, he wasn't trying to conceal. He was trying to reveal. But what we should do Verse 15, when we receive the word in our hearts and bring forth fruit, we should then go on to share the word with others. You know, one of the ways for you to be strengthened in the word and grow in the word and to be changed by the word is to share it with others. If you only take in and you never give out, the word will not have its effect in your life. You must pass on what you've learned. So let your light shine, verse 16. He says, verse 17, for nothing in secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, verse 18, how you hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not. Now the haves are those who hear and receive the word. God gives them more knowledge, more understanding and especially as they share it with others. But those who do not receive the word and believe the word, they have not, verse 18, from him shall be taken even that which he seems to have. And then thirdly, verse 19 to 21, we're not only to hear and receive, hear and share, we're to hear and obey. Verse 19 to 21. Then came to him his mother, and his brethren. And this is his literal mother Mary and his brothers. Mary and Joseph had other children, his stepbrothers. And they could not get to Jesus because of the crowds, the press. And it was told them by certain that said, your mother and your brother stand without desiring to see you. And Jesus answered and said unto them, my mother and my brethren are these which what? Hear the word of God, and what? Do it. 
Now, again, the other gospels are a lot more full and complete. His mother and his brothers went to him because they thought he had flipped out. They went to try to save him from himself. But they couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd. So through the crowd, someone said, hey, you know your mom's here? Hey, you know your brothers are here? And Jesus wasn't diminishing the value of the family, but he was elevating the value of the word of God, of hearing it, sharing it, and obey it. More important than your biological family. Jesus said, if you follow me, take up your cross and follow me. If you hate not your father and mother, your own life inside, you're not fit to be my disciple. More important than your own biological family is your hearing God's word, receiving God's word, sharing God's word, and obeying God's word. Jesus said, my mother and my brethren are those who hear the word of God and keep it, obey it. The book of James tells us that the Bible is like a mirror. Did you ever notice that mirrors don't lie? I don't like mirrors that have good lighting around them. I like softly lit mirrors. And when the light comes in just right and just, I'm looking good. And someone flips the switch, ah, turn the light down. And if you're having a problem with what you see in the mirror, you don't need a new mirror. You need to fix yourself up. So when you look at the Bible <clears throat> and you see yourself, parables are mirrors to see ourselves. Where's your heart? Is it hard? Is it shallow? Is it crowded? Is it cluttered with worries or cares or pleasures of this life? Is your heart good soil? Do you hear the word of God? Does it take root in your life? Does it bring forth fruit for the glory of God? But the Bible also and the parables are also windows that we see through and we see the world around us. So what we need to do is take what we see, what we hear, what we receive, and we need to put it in shoe leather, amen? Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Let's pray.